anecdotally, what we see is we believe that about half of the orders are uh, people buying it as a gift for somebody else, which I think is much different than T-shirts. Typically, people are buying a T-shirt for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different, it's a gifting mindset. So, you know, a lot of what we see is a lot of um, designs that are to my wife, to my to my son, to my daughter, to my husband. So, and it might actually even say that on the piece itself. So, like you're pulling heartstrings. If you're pulling heartstrings and you're giving this as a gift to somebody else, um, it can be a total, you know, win-win. Uh, the best thing to do is with jewelry is to make people cry. If you can get them to cry, that's dollar signs in their eyes, and, uh, and they will buy from you. Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today I have a fellow Eric on the podcast, Eric Tosco. So I met Eric at the Tan Brothers uh, event in Barcelona and we just sort of gravitated to each other and we started talking and I could just tell from his story and from the level that we were vibing on essentially that, uh, that, that we were going to be that we were going to be friends and compatriots kind of going forward. Uh, Eric, uh, his story is fantastic. He started, he's been in the e-commerce game now, uh, for several years and a couple years ago, he created shine on jewelry, which is a massive, uh, print on demand, um, jewelry, uh, production fulfillment house. They now have over 5,000 publishers, um, creating mostly Shopify stores, selling their diverse jewelry, um, throughout the world. Eric is has built his business on some really sound practices. He's he's experienced a lot of really cool things, uh, and so we decided to bring him out to e-commerce mastery live in Bangkok, Thailand, on December seventh, where he will be speaking on the real power of LTV when it comes to building your business and the key pillars that you need to have in order to first understand your LTV and then the ways that you should be thinking about leveraging it throughout your business. He is an excellent presenter. He just got off the stage at Adrian Morrison's event. Um, so I know that, that he's, he's working at a high level. Uh, he's just a super interesting guy. We'll get into some of the more esoteric things he's into maybe at the end of the podcast. <laughs> but I want to welcome Eric Tosco to the podcast. How you doing today? Great. Hey, hello, everybody. Hope to see you in Bangkok. And Eric, man, I don't know how else to say it. It was just a vibe, man. I uh, didn't know who you were, but uh, just felt it out. And, you know, look where we're at now. Here we are. We're going to go into the land <laughs> yep. of smiles together to, to, to perform in front of uh, 400 amazing e-commerce fanatics. Uh, I cannot Absolutely. wait for it. Just magic. I talk about this all the time if you're on the email list. Like magic just happens in Bangkok. Uh, and so, you know, magic happened in Barcelona for us last time we were there. So so I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get into some trouble in, in Bangkok, which will be fun. So uh, oh, yeah. let's start with your hero's journey. Uh, let's talk about how you started uh, where you came from and how you got to where you are today. Well, th thanks. I, I actually, I like telling the story. It's a, it's kind of a long one. I'm sure, you know, everyone sort of has their rags to riches story, but I'll try to summarize it for everybody. Um, so I was, uh, the first employee at a startup in Cambridge, uh, next to Boston. And, uh, it was a website called custommade.com, which is still around. And, uh, you know, I was 22 years old. I was a, uh, com coming in like a bat out of hell. And uh, we, were, uh, we were actually a custom woodworking website. So it was my job to go out and recruit all these amazing artisans. And uh, me and my team, we recruited about 10,000 of these artisans in the first year, sort of tapped out woodworking. And then we said, well, what else can we, uh, who else can we recruit? So uh, I started recruiting custom jewelers. And, uh, and we became a platform where you could request anything you want custom made, but jewelry became our number one selling item by far. And um, t towards the end of my time there in year four, four or five, I started saying, well, guys, you know, instead of uh, distributing all of these jobs to various artisans across the world, why don't we uh, become the manufacturer and we can um, control the supply chain and make a, a much better customer experience, a guaranteed experience. And so this was right in uh, 2014, right around the same time where Teespring uh, started uh, really coming on strong. People like Don Wilson started 
uh, creating content on how to make money selling t-shirts online. And so, um, you know, that was only an hour away in Providence. Teespring was at the time. And so I said, holy shit, you know, this is an amazing business. I have no idea what's going on. I didn't know like Facebook marketers even existed at that time, you know, uh, creating and selling products and arbitraging traffic for affiliate offers. I had no idea. But all I knew was I wanted to do what they were doing and do it in jewelry. And so I actually asked that company to fire me. I said, hey, can you fire me? They said, why? you know, why do you want us to fire you? I'm like, well, man, you know, I've been here for a long time. We're all good friends. And, uh, but I want to go do this jewelry thing. And, uh, they said, dude, of course we'll fire you. So they fired me. I used my unemployment money to start shine on with a small investment from, uh, from my former bosses as well. And it was sort of off to the races. I f actually flew to Thailand, um, and learned about jewelry production. And I flew to Serbia and learned about um, 3D modeling for jewelry. And after a year of sort of being a seller myself, uh, I did want to go out and create a platform. So I recruited a few folks and we raised uh, about a million and a half dollars venture capital. And um, fast forward to, you know, that was a couple years ago. And here we are today. And now the main difference is we have our own on demand factory in New Jersey. Very cool. And yeah, you've got a really cool story about your actual factory too, which we'll get into. But you, yeah, so this this sort of concept of going from, um, you know, from the custom made, uh, you know, uh, workshop where people are building things to, to the custom made jewelry, I wanted to ask, what did the jewelry at that point, like, because I understand now most of your jewelry is sort of like a print on demand style, as far as I understand it. Mm -hmm. It's 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 basically you know go, you can go after different, any sort of niche with what you can kind of create. Basically, you're creating mm -hmm. sort of like meditations almost, or like you know really cool sentiments that people are putting onto these these things. But when you started, was it based? Was it more on like traditional different kinds of pieces of jewelry? And are those still part of your business? So the original ShineOn.com platform, which you can still see. We still have a few sellers selling on that. Yes, they're selling three D three dimensional jewelry, which is really anything that you could imagine. And uh, we've done we have over eight thousand molds for all those designs. And we sort of paused that um, because we made a decision that we want to bring all manufacturing back to the USA. And so we started with doing the graphical POD jewelry, uh, if you want to use that term. Uh, we started doing that. And hopefully next year we'll be able to bring over the three-dimensional jewelry to uh, uh, to be made in America as well. That's very cool. And so when you when you talk about three-dimensional jewelry, is it are people like able to? Because in this case, you're able to upload designs in the print-on-demand you know area, just like with T-shirts and everything else, you're able to upload any sort of complexity of design, and it's sort of laser printed right there on on the jewelry. Mm -hmm. How does the three? How did the three D work? Are people like are are people? Is it sort of more like an AliExpress thing where people are looking at the jewelry and saying, "I like that," or are they actually like being able to control the way the jewelry is created or design it themselves? No, we would. Uh, uh, so in our how we do three D is we actually work with the seller on a unique design uh, and handle all the. Uh, the design, the prototyping, the, the mold making, the casting, the warehousing, all of that stuff is sort of full service. Yeah. So uh, we'll see what happens in the timing for that next year. Mm -hmm. As of right now, the, the products that we have on our Shopify app are incredibly high margin. Um, there's no work. You know, everything's automated in the app. We just launched uh, Rings on Demand. Uh, which is which is really exciting. I actually have a piece right here. Nope. That's not it. Well, if I could find it later on, I'll uh, I'll have to show everybody. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. But uh, go to, just, yeah, go ahead. No, I mean that's uh, really been a long time coming. Doing rings on demand, people have been wanting it for ages. So uh, it's difficult because uh, we actually do do unique uh, designs. It's not just one size fits all. So there's a big investment in that, but we were able to pull it off. Very cool. So talk a little bit about jewelry. You know, you noticed uh, when you started selling it uh, that it was that it was doing better than than any other kind of products you were trying to sell. Why is jewelry the holy grail of, of sort of online selling or one of or one of the really good options for when it comes to selling things online? <clears throat> well, there's a couple things. You know, I think the most important is you have to look at profit margins. So for the seller, all of our base costs, the sellers are typically selling them for 
three to four X, uh, sometimes even five X the cost. Um, so that's really the no, that's the first thing sellers should be thinking about is when you're selecting products is what's your profit margin. Um, the second thing is, you know, how can it be tailored to my audience? So that's a definitive. Yes. The jewelry can be, um, you know, made for any audience. Um, I think for jewelry, I think the one thing we didn't expect, and this is a little secret, I don't know if I should even be giving it away today, but uh, a lot of our jewelry actually is uh, not necessarily the simple designs that sell, but a lot of text quotes mm. and um, a lot of poems. And I, to me, I really feel like uh, the best thing to do is with jewelry is to make people cry. If you can get them to cry, that's dollar signs in their eyes and, uh, and they will buy from you. <laughs> I like that heartstrings is how you described it to me when, when we were talking earlier about being able to pull those mm. heartstrings. Um, and, and it's funny, like, you know, I've, uh, I'm dabbling with shine on, I can, I can tell people. And, uh, and, and when you're trying to come up with these things, you're, you are, you're, you're, you're going after very specific audiences and you're trying to yep. figure out what will pull their heartstrings. And at the same time, you're, you're just giving them, even if it's, you know, even if it's a little cheesy, it's a beautiful sentiment. It's, they're all beautiful. It's like, it's, you know, on your, you guys have the good vibes only sort of thing going on with, with shine on. And it is like, you're not going to send someone a, you know, a hate mail, you know, on an anti-Semitic, you know, screed on a piece of jewelry or anything like that. You're, you're saying beautiful things. You're kind of sending them into you, into the universe. So it feels like a, feels like a pretty cool enterprise to, to be a part of. And, and I know you guys talk a lot about niches, right? So like in your emails where you talk about like, there are so many good niches. Can you talk like mm -hmm. broadly about the way to think about niches with print on demand jewelry? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, just to follow up on pulling heartstrings. So, you know, we see, uh, because we have a, an engraving upsell, custom personalized engraving by the buyer, we see people, um, at, uh, you know, asking, will you be my wife? You know, we ask people, like people are giving these for real reasons. Like, um, maybe they just lost us, a, um, a sibling or, or family member. And, and there's a photo upload. We get a lot of in remembrance jewelry. Um, in our factory and so doing those things i mean we like we get choked up seeing some of the orders that come in um but yeah uh, uh and just to follow up on your second question what was it again about niches because i know you know in your emails mm. you send out there's lots of niches you could kind of go after with this kind of thing like what is the way to think about niches you know when, when we i was promoting the last course that we did we talked a lot about passion niches about being able to understand the difference between um, something that people think is cool and something that, you know, really creates like a burning desire to buy, like a, a real, like direct response sort of marketing. And so talk a little mm -hmm. bit about the kinds of niches uh, that, that work with these kinds of products. Right. So anecdotally, what we see is we believe that about half of the orders are uh, people buying it as a gift for somebody else, which I think is much different than t-shirts typically people are buying a t-shirt for themselves right mm -hmm. um so it's a different it's a gifting mindset so you know a lot of what we see is a lot of um designs that are to my wife to my to my son to my daughter to my husband so and it might actually even say that on the piece itself so like you're pulling heartstrings if you're pulling heartstrings and you're giving this as a gift to somebody else um it can be a total, you know, win-win. Yeah. I like it. So Could gifts, be. heartstrings. And then to me, there's always a third element as well that I've seen. And I, I'm not, I don't want to give anything away uh, for anyone, but there's, there's usually a third element when it comes to the angle as well. And it could be, and, it, it, and those things are sort of like the targetable interests. So first of all, you've got the fact that it's a gift. You've got the fact that it's for a certain kind of person. And then there usually, usually seems to be some kind of third element where you're actually targeting a targetable niche, like a sports lover or a job profession mm -hmm. or, or things like that. That seems to be where the sweet spot is with this stuff. Would you agree? Yes. But I mean, we also see, you know, sort of when I say to my wife, husband, brother, those are, can be just wide open, you know, anybody with a son or anybody with a wife. So those audiences are, you know, 50 million person audiences. But as far as the, 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 the niches themselves, we see a lot of uh, sort of patriotism based. We see a lot of different countries, mm. uh, you know, uh, Irish jewelry, Puerto Rican jewelry, Polish jewelry, 
Italian, all those sort of mainstays, um, those will always sell all year long. Those sort of uh, pride, I guess you call them pride mm-hmm. um, styles. But I mean, we see we see all sorts of stuff. I mean, yoga jewelry, we see uh, pretty much all the niches you would expect with anything print on demand. Uh, you, you can see it in jewelry. And that's because we have not only hearts and, and sentimental stuff, but, you know, we have dog tags. We have rings for bikers. Um, we have uh, uh, the rings actually just started selling for like army veterans uh, and, and Navy veterans and things like that. So depending on the piece that you choose, you can tailor that for the niche. And, you know, if you haven't seen the jewelry, it's worth it's worth checking out on. on you, you can see some examples on the Shine On Facebook page, which is a great, great community that, that you have going on Facebook there. But there's like no limitation almost on the level of detail you can put into these things. And, uh, and you know, even the amount of text. It's, it, it's funny. I see some of them and I think of the T-shirt that was really popular last year that a bunch of like young millennials were buying. And it was just a giant block of text. And it was the entire script of the B-movie. <laughs> like it was just this weird sort of, and so the <laughs> amount that you can kind of put on there, I think wow. there's, there's a, there's a real, there's almost no limitation to the, the sentiments that can be conveyed on these things and, and, and the design elements you can bring to the table. It's really, it's a really interesting product and it's cool that it's taken off. So you have mm-hmm. uh, over 5,000 sellers at this point. Yes. Yes. We have, uh, that's in our fr- first year. The app's only been around for about one year now. So okay. we're moving into year two. And um, we have, it's all been word of mouth. We've barely done any paid promotion at all. So yeah, those 5,000 were all word of mouth, which uh, I think just says that our product is a, is a good value for the yeah. seller and the buyer. And the buyer. Uh, we get a lot of repeat orders for sure. Uh, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about, so there's a couple things about why jewelry is so good. Obviously, the, the, the big thing is that it's... Uh, that it's got a good markup. You can essentially three or four, even five mm-hmm. X the, the cost that you pay in order to fulfill it. The other thing is how easy it is to ship. Uh, it's, it, it's so mm-hmm. small. It comes your, and the other option is you guys actually provide customized, um, customized packaging, uh, on request as well, which I think is a really cool thing that really helps that customer experience. It's easier to ship. And because you guys actually are centered in the U S uh, it, shipping times are great throughout the U.S., and you don't have to worry about any of this stuff coming down the pipe with uh, with the e-packet, with the Trump's uh, repealing of the of the, the trade, you know, the, the the shipping subsidy essentially. So talk a little bit about that. About e-packet. To talk a little bit about e-packet and 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 your your decision that predated that to make sure that everything was going to be built in the U.S. Oh right, yeah. So. Uh... I think we're going to see more industries, not just print on demand, but more industries in general moving to an on-demand manufacturing model. Mm. Uh, it's a really difficult thing to set up, but the it allows better cash flow for everybody. So I think we're just starting with businesses like ours and, and T-shirts, but it's going to be in all sorts of stuff. For me, I mean, I'm not here to make a quick buck. You know, I'm going to be in this for the long haul, and so. I have to really consider the trends that are happening. Um, you know, we want it to be made here. We want it to be made by moms. You know, we have about 20 or 30 mothers that are making all of our sellers jewelry, which is really fun. My favorite thing in the world is to go in in the morning and with my coffee and, and talk to all the moms after they drop off their kids from school. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, investment that goes on in doing this all in America. But over time, it's going to be well worth it from everybody, from uh, ideas that we come up with. You know, we just hired a second full-time videographer, photographer. So we have two now that are full-time. We have like a lot. We do a live video service. We'll actually manufacture your item and then we'll um, take videos for you. Um, And I can talk more about that in, in Bangkok for sure. Um, so there's, we're investing a lot right now, you know, we're reinvesting everything that's sort of made back into the more machinery and and better ideas and new products for our sellers. So it's just a different mindset. I think that a lot of people who want to make a quick, a quick buck, you know, and then with e-packet, I'm yeah, with e-packet, I mean, we've, I've been, I've, I've just had it in the back of my head. Like I know it, I knew at some point, you know, something was gonna, was gonna blow, um, with that, basically subsidizing packages coming from China, 
It's mm-hmm. more expensive for us to ship it than it does for AliExpress, but it's just um, things are going to be be more even in the near future, um, which makes our offer even you know better. Yeah, and it's it's the, like just going through your checkout process and your the, you know the the write ups that you have built into the Julia already. It's just it's a really attractive product, and I imagine for the market, the fact that it's produced in the U.S., produced by by moms, is just part of that investment that helps sell all of your customers jewelry. Like I think it's a really, it's a really cool mindset and it's something that, uh, that it, it's worth jumping on and taking a look because of how much you guys are investing in the, in the whole experience. Yeah. I mean, it's, we really slow it down. We slow everything down. We write, you know, I, based on my long experience with jewelry, you know, I'm at all the copy you see in those products. I'm actually the one writing it, you know, like I, <laughs> People are like, Eric, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. But I'm like, no, man, like, I, I, I think I know, you know, my long jewelry experience, what, what people want to hear. So, yeah, uh, That's I'm, funny. I'm all write, over the place. They say the same thing to me, Eric, you don't need to write all the website texts. <laughs> but I'm like, no, I have to. I, I've, been, I've been to all these events. I know. I know what people want. So do you want to hear more from yeah. Eric uh, on these topics and more? We're going to get into a little bit more about what he's actually going to be talking about in uh, in Bangkok. But you got to come to Bangkok. Uh, come to e-commerce mastery live, see Eric. He's one of the seven speakers we have. We're planning a bunch of fun stuff to make the day special. Um, so make sure you come and catch us there. Now you mentioned right before when you were talking about repeat customers, uh, and how that's mm-hmm. another attractive aspect of, of jewelry. So how LTV and understanding your LTV can, you know, impact so many different aspects of your business. I know, uh, your presentation that you just did with Adrian Morrison was about how to build and sell a million dollar business. Um, so talk a little mm-hmm. bit about the, the LTV mindset and what, uh, you know, having a good LTV and having a good understanding of your LTV, how it benefits your business in total. Sure. I mean, I think a couple of years ago with Facebook, you know, anybody could be a, a turn and burn marketer, meaning they're only focusing on getting that first sale. And those first sales, those first customers, they could at the time be wildly profitable. But now marketers are getting, the good ones are getting smart where they're looking at really just sometimes even breaking even on that first sale, knowing that if they build, have a great brand and they do a good job staying in communication with the customer and they deliver a good product that they'll make way, way more money, you know, over the lifetime of that customer. And so my talk in Bangkok is going to be exactly about lifetime value of a customer and how you can actually use this metric. Uh, to determine bu- uh, budgets for scaling up, you know, if if uh, if I'm allocating five dollars for customer support, uh, that's part of the lifetime value of a customer. You know, what's this going to look like when we have ten times the customers? You can break down your but your business and budget with lifetime value. You can also raise venture capital and or sell your business when you know the lifetime value of your entire customer base. Um, and I th- actually think that selling your business, is, it's the same thing as raising money. Somebody's making an investment with the hope that it'll be worth more in the future. So if you can show people what the uh, your customer base is worth in the future, then you can get a really good, accurate um, visualization uh, on, on how much your company is worth and the future value. And so your key levers when it comes to LTV uh, it's got to be email, right? It's got to be, you know, being staying in touch with that customer, making sure that the list is kept warm and that you can dynamically sort of reach out to people. Like talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms of LTV as it relates to, to Shine On specifically. Like, is it a matter of keeping track of those purchase dates and, and, and then making sure that you're creating ad segments based on when people bought and waiting a couple months with a new message that might appeal to them? Like what are some actual mechanisms related to jewelry that that are that people can put in place in order to generate higher LTV. I mean, I just break it. I'll give everybody the formula that sort of I use for LTV when I'm there in Bangkok. But the first one is just uh, first one is just getting your average order value up. Okay, so I think that's a combination of selling a high margin product. You know, our top seller right now is selling the jewelry for forty nine ninety five with a base cost of $9.97. And this same person is using a lot of tricks on their Shopify store to get multiple orders, okay? So increasing the AOV, 
decreasing the cost to acquire. Um, so, you know, the higher margin you have, that that's a lower uh, acquisition cost. Um, but on the ads front, you have to have a remarkable product and a re really a remarkable offer to decrease your acquisition costs to increase LTV. And so we're actually going to be offering a, uh, this is a little secret. Uh, maybe we'll launch it in Bangkok, but uh, we're launching the first Made in America free plus shipping item, uh, which is going to be crazy. The price is going to be so low that sellers can literally give this away and uh, and they can use it for um, building lists and, uh, and and getting a ton of customers that have a high lifetime value. So I think increase your AOV, decrease your acquisition costs. And then the third would really be yeah, increasing your repeat purchase rate. So good quality product. Um, I feel like we do that. But also there's a lot of opportunities I think people are missing for um, uh, getting the repeat purchase beyond just Facebook Messenger retargeting and retargeting ads. Uh, we actually offer all sellers white labeling where they can they can upload a coupon and we'll put that inside of the box. So, you know, the customer is opening their 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 piece that they ordered for the first time they're all smiles and uh, that's a great time to ask for another order with a discount um, that and uh, catalogs actually we're creating an on-demand catalog service so we're like all bought in on helping people build you know full-fledged brands we're not just about turn and burn um, we're, we're making a heavy investment in all these things because shopify has an exchange now you can sell your shopify store um, creating and selling these stores is going to be much more mainstream over the next couple of years. And so we're totally on top of it for everyone. Very cool. Now, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in as someone who's playing around with shine on is, is that idea of traction. You know, how, when you, you've built out a brand that you think looks good, you feel like you've built out some designs that are really, really top, you know, that, that are that are going after a specific audience. You want to spend some ad, ad dollars. But what are some other things that you can do uh, in order to sort of gain traction with that audience and inspire people to make that purchase? Does it come down to just really good ads, really good targeting, really good jewelry designs that target that specific group? And you just build on on that by 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 investing ad dollars? What are some other things people can do to, to gain traction with these audiences? I mean, there's there's always one strategy that's you know, break even on that first sale and, you know, maybe lower the price just so you can start building up lists, right? Mm. Um, even if they're not buying at the lower price, you might get more add to carts, okay? So I think as far as traction goes, you just want to start building up those pixels, warming up those pixels and getting people into your email lists too. But I think as far as uh, early, early traction is... Um, you know, just think about gifting and maybe try the reverse targeting. So, you know, if it's a T-shirt that you're targeting the wearer with jewelry, you might actually be targeting the husband if it's for the wife or you might be targeting the mom if it's for the daughter. So people need to seriously test. Uh, I guess we call it reverse targeting. I don't know what people call it, but gifting targeting. Uh, I think you might be surprised. At 100% around like the holidays, like Christmas and Valentine's Day, Mother's Day and Father's Day, they're total like gifting targeting that you can try. And then, you know, through the rest of the year, uh, it's a good option as well, but especially around holidays. I love it. And, and, and if you go down the, that niche value where you've got, okay, who's the gifty, who's the gifter? And, and what does that gifter know about the giftee? And in a lot of cases, it'll be like, I know they like sports or I know that they're this or I know that. And so it's sort of like, you know, if you're a, a parent or a grandparent buying a gift for a younger person, you, you might not know everything about them, but you'll know that they're interested in one thing. And, and so I think I think that third angle as well when it comes to gifting, I think could be pretty, pretty important as well. Mm. But again, Absolutely. the wide open stuff also works. Yeah. Very, Absolutely. Very cool. I had I had another question here. I, I remember when we originally talked about what you were going to talk about in Bangkok. You talked about getting funding for the business and how mm -hmm. when you got some because it's it's kind of rare in this space. I think I think most people have this sort of Russell Brunson idea of 
uh, of bootstrapping and you know saving up some money to get some ad spend and make it happen. But when you're building a full apparatus, a full you know a full platform, a, f- a full network, when it comes to um, providing products like this, uh, you know your investment was it was obviously a great idea. But you said that you didn't always make the best decisions with with the funds that you had when you when you had them. Uh, and can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that period of having this fund and talk about some of the some of the, the maybe the mistakes that you made while you had this this venture back capital while you built this business? Yeah, I think uh, investors are uh, venture capital can be a great vehicle. But I think uh, the point of venture capital is to uh, do something that can be done in 10 years, but do it in two years. Right. So you're actually encouraged to sort of spend that money and it's either going to pop quickly or it's not but that is all just sort of a fallacy uh and it's kind of how you you treat you treat it mentally because as a new venture like for us with jewelry on demand no one's ever no one had ever done it before we didn't necessarily know what we were getting into but we were sort of um i think some of the mistakes i had made back then were like just uh, uh sort of hiring up really fast without having the uh, all of our profit margins down uh, at the time and sort of doing the doing the structure and and, and the uh, and the budgeting and all that stuff properly and just uh, rising slow like we kind of came out of the gate really really fast throwing money at solving something and you know maybe that was a little bit inefficient um, but as an entrepreneur I've sort of learned to um, that uh, slower can be better in some certain circumstances yeah i got you that that, that would then, have been an interesting period part of the part of my talk in bangkok too is is going to be about raising venture capital and basically uh, the two the two main metrics that you need to know uh in order to raise venture capital i think it's a it's a great topic it's something that you're right very few people in our industry do um, but it can be a great mechanism for your business. So I hope I'm excited to speak to everybody about it there. Very cool. Now, uh, I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but one of the reasons that I think we hit it off is we we, we were we, we ended up talking a lot in Barcelona about, uh, I don't know, the not the spiritual path that we were on necessarily, but the sort of the things that we were thinking about and the things that, you know, the way that we perceived the world in a way. And I wanted to just do a check in on, you know, you, you had told me a really interesting story about, um, about how you had tried to remove all stimulation from your life for a period of time in order to really sort of, uh, you know, be, be conscious of, of, of who you are and, and what you were trying to do. I wanted to just get a little update on where you were at in terms of your consciousness these days. What are, what are some of the things that you're exploring that, that sort of like that, that, that get you excited? I mean, man, there's, I think myself, but like all e-com people, you know, whenever we get that sale or that Shopify sort of sound going off on our phone, like that's actually, that's releasing dopamine, you know, go, go look it up on Google. Like anytime you're using your smartphone, like that's, that's releasing dopamine. Uh, Not only that, but, you know, caffeine and and even like things like loud music and and of course like alcohol and, and all that stuff. So we're sort of living these lives that all the all these sort of stimulations they really add up, and um, it sort of desensitizes our brain to things like dopamine, and we need more and more of it just to feel good and, and actually just focus and have like a normal day. That's why it feels so good if you take uh, two or three days off. Your focus is much better because your your brain physically has actually reset. Um, and so yeah, this. Now I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I uh, I try to do healthy brain habits as much as possible. And maybe that'll be part of the talk in Bangkok, maybe not. But I, I will jam about anybody uh, on that at any time. Um, but uh, dop- dopamine reboot reset, I call it, um, like it. which is kind of just going going cold turkey on every sort of bad habit you can imagine. <laughs> It, it is because it just sort of cascades. It's funny. It's like, every, it's like you, you know, even as you're doing these things that you know are not always the best for your brain or, or for your, you, you sort of have this in the back of your mind that like one day I won't do these things. One day I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be, you know, uh, you know, I, I won't be dealing with this, but you don't, you just sort of cascade on and, and, and they, they pile up over time. So I can imagine taking that reset break could be, could be a powerful experience for you. And, and for you, it particularly was, I think the quote was, Man, after a few days of this, 
I saw a puppy on the street, and I just started laughing and crying. And I was like, oh, that sounds so beautiful. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, and this is actually in a book. Uh, I have a chapter in a book called Three Billion Under 30. And um, I talk about this, but yeah, I, uh, after about six months of going cold turkey on everything, yeah, I could look at a puppy and that, that was like the most amazing thing. Uh, you know, I would literally, I couldn't help it, but just start smiling from it um, because I really had no like stimulation for so long. <laughs> I love it. Well, if you're looking for stimulation, then you should definitely come to Bangkok, Thailand on December 7th for e-commerce mastery live. You should probably come to affiliate world, which is the conference that leads up to uh, e-commerce mastery live, which is uh, one of the world's best conferences. Have you been to any affiliate worlds before? Eric, I've, I've been to the affiliate world, uh, conference in, in Bangkok. Oh, yeah. nice. Think, so two years ago. Yep. N nice. Well, this will be a repeat for you. It's going to be a fantastic time. Uh, and so get your tickets now. Prices will be going up soon. Uh, there's a few more price breaks before we reach our final door price. Um, but if you're, if you're waiting, don't wait because the price is only going up, uh, and tickets are definitely limited and selling out quickly. So, uh, come meet Eric and I in Bangkok. It's been a pleasure talking with you as always, uh, Eric, and uh, I look forward to seeing you very soon. Likewise, it's been super fun. Can't wait to see everybody in person. And uh, I can't wait to prepare more for this talk and, uh, uh, and you know, provide my, uh, all my experience and knowledge over the past couple of years with Jewelry On Demand. Very cool. Awesome, man. We'll catch you then. All right. See ya. See ya.